Hello, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the intelligent social media platform. It's been a while since we've done one of these podcast discussions with Dr. Jonathan Cook. Today, we'll be talking about Herman Melville's OMU. There's been a bit of a break in our conversations as the result of the worldwide <laughs> pandemic, but we persevere. And I'm thankful to have Dr. Cook back with us today uh, to jog my memory of uh -huh. OMU. We got a little delayed. Um, before we get into it, I want to obviously recommend that you download the Noetic app at noetic.app and go to the uh, Noetic YouTube channel to check out this conversation, which I should have up later this evening. This is August 9th, 2020. I want to make a recommendation since I had to catch up very quickly. I'll put these in the notes for the show. Um, I found a scholar online by the name of Evan Lamp, who has done some OMU analysis and summarization, and he has a podcast called 100 Pages at a Time. I recommend that for anyone who's trying to do a quick study on this book, and he seems to be in control of the literature. I might even reach out to him at some point to talk about other things. But as far as I know, no one will go as deep as Dr. Cook and I will go on Herman Melville's OMU today. So we are preempted a little bit, but I do think that this will be the most in-depth analysis of the text to date that you can find in a podcast form. So Dr. Cook, uh, let's get started. And um, perhaps we should just kind of talk about the origination story of this text. What, what led to its creation? Yeah, uh, so... Um... Omu emerged right after Taipei. So Taipei was Melville's first narrative. And, you know, at this point, in the beginning of his career, he was writing what he thought were travel narratives, which we today we read as novels because they have, you know, characterization and description that seem so novelistic. So he, he wrote Taipei after he came back from living or he spent almost four years uh, in the Pacific shipping out as a whaler in 1841. He returned to Boston in October 1844. Uh, he had been telling a lot of stories about the time he spent on uh, uh, the Marquesa Islands as a you know so-called captive of cannibals there, cannibal tribe of Taipei. So he started writing that narrative in the beginning of 1845, and he finished that in the following fall, uh, living in New York, but also spend going up to where his uh, his mother and his siblings were living, or some of them up just north of Albany in a town called Lansingburg. So he um, he published Taipei in February 1846. And then immediately started work on a follow-up narrative, Omu, which uh, if you read Omu, he mentions the fact that it begins right after he was sort of liberated from this his captivity in this valley of the Taipei uh, tribe. And he got onto a ship. Um, in, in real life, it was called the Lucy Ann. It was a, a, a whaling vessel out of Sydney, Australia. Uh, in the novel, it's called the Julia, and uh, so this narrative follows his career from the time he left the Marquesa Islands to um, through the time that he spent on uh, Tahiti and the region. Uh, that was through the fall of 1842. He left uh, the Marquesas in August 1842, and then. He got to Tahiti in the fall and then left. So he's writing about this uh, pretty much four years later. And so he um, he's in New York City. He, he could stay with his brother, uh, Alan, who was a lawyer, uh, living in the city. And uh, his older brother, Gansevoort, was actually the secretary to the legation of the American Embassy to England. And his brother was his agent for his first book, Taipei. And he was also going to be placing his second book, Omu, um, which he was writing, uh, you know, start, as I said, starting in 1846. And he finished it in November 1846. So 
The terrible thing for Melville, though, was uh, in about May 1846, his brother Gansevoort, his older brother, his beloved bro brother, died of mysterious causes. Um, and uh, we don't really know what happened to him. It sounds like it might have been uh, something like a brain tumor. He, he just kind of started to fall apart and then died without any obvious explanation. So in the middle of writing Omu, his brother died, who and his older brother Gansevoort was the, he was the you know the pride of the family because he was brilliant, and he had a career in politics before he went to England. Uh, as a diplomat, he helped uh, elect um, James Polk during the election of 1844, and then kind of as a reward for his his work. For the Democratic Party, he got this dipl diplomatic job. Um, so in the middle of writing Omu, his brother dies. So it's it's very odd because Omu is kind of a happy-go-lucky, picaresque novel with a lot of humor to it. But in the middle of writing this humorous book, he had to deal with getting his brother's body shipped back from England to New York and then disposing of it going up and having him buried um, I was going to say that's completely astonishing given the tone of the book. Like yeah, I, yeah, I'm not really sure. I think he was just kind of suppressing it. I think he, he just didn't want to endanger his success as a writer by you know completely freaking out. But the other positive thing that happened in 1846 was that, you know, while he was writing the book um, in New York, he he went up to visit uh, his mother and sisters and younger brother um, occasionally, but in um, two months during the fall, uh, a young woman named Elizabeth Shaw came to visit uh, two of his sisters who were friends with her. She lived in Boston with her father, Lemuel Shaw, uh, who was the ch uh, chief uh, justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And sh her family, her father, Lemuel Shaw, was an old friend of the Melville family, a friend of Melville's father, Alan, and he actually had been engaged to uh, Alan Melville's sister, so uh, who died young. So Melville's aunt was engaged to this guy, Lemuel Shaw, and so um, the family were friends, although they hadn't really communicated very much for the last decade or so. But anyway, Elizabeth Shaw came and stayed in Lansingburg, New York with the Melville family. And while Melville was there, he got to know her. And then he ended up getting engaged to her and marrying her the following August in 1847. So he finished Omu when he was probably getting the idea that he was going to marry Elizabeth Shaw. So, you know, this probably would have enhanced his happy mood um, if he was, you know, thinking about the loss of his brother. So it's kind of a, a, a weird part of his life, but he was definitely, you know, still young and buoyant. Um, I mean, he's only, what, 26, 27 at this point, and um, still kind of learning his trade. I mean, type he, uh, just kind of came out of him when he started reminiscing about what happened to him in in the South Seas, and he just he put it together, and um, people liked it and thought it was entertaining, and then it 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 created a, a good impression in England and America. So he said, "Why not write a, a follow up book?" Because he had a whole other set of adventures to describe um, in that book. So it was published in um, England first at the end of March 30th, 1847, and then a month later, pretty much May 1st, in New York City, because you always had to publish in England first to get the copyright, right. so no one would, um, um, you know, steal your your copyright, in, or, you know, print, print your book without authorization. So that's how it came to be. Yeah, I remember reading up on that copyright law recently. I. I, it, it sounds like it was total chaos. Yeah, really, it United. was appalling because you, you know, all these authors, American authors, couldn't get copyright, 
uh, protection. They couldn't, uh, you know, you could you could just reprint someone's work without paying the publisher or the author. You didn't get copyright until the 1890s, or really until you got a good law in place. So it was really kind of scandalous because authors were tr constantly trying to get their rights respected, and it didn't go over well because publishers, you know, they didn't care. They were making good money. It was the authors who paid for the lack of copyright. Sure. Well, all this autobiographical information is very. Um... It, it it's it's uh, it raises a lot of interesting questions given some of the content of Taipei and some you of the research that Omu. I, I, Omu. I'm sorry I'm sorry sorry slip of the tongue um, of Omu some of the research that I did on Omu uh, seemed to indicate that the that these weren't such autobiographical tales that there was a lot of sensationalism going on and fabrication that occurred how do we know what was real and what was yeah. not real from Melville's life that is included in, in these stories? Well, the basic skeleton of the story is, is totally authentic. I mean, <clears throat> we have documents that verify that, you know, he was on this ship. The mate's name was John German. He, 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 he just changed the spelling slightly of the first mate's name. He changed the name of the captain uh, a little more drastically. <clears throat> but also the mutiny in Tahiti when the sailors refused to ship out because they they knew the captain was sick and they, they thought it was dangerous to be going out whaling again. That took place and they discovered the documents for that actually uh, in Sydney, Australia. Um, I forget how long it took, but they have actual... <clears throat> documents um, that describe the mutiny. And then <clears throat> you have uh, reminiscences of other people who were in Tahiti who mentioned, you know, meeting Herman Melville. <clears throat> and uh, I was just reading an article about um, <clears throat> two brothers who talk about the two guys where... Dr. Longghost and Omu go to work on their farm, Zeke and Shorty, these right. two kind of entrepreneurs who are farming. They're told to go there by these two American brothers, um, and it turns out one of those guys wrote a memoir about his life as a sailor later on and mentioned <clears throat> the fact that, yes, he worked for Zeke and uh, Shorty, and he told Herman Melville... Uh, that he could find work there with um, when he was, you know, with this guy, Dr. Longos. That was his his nickname. His his name in real life was John Troy, and he was not a doctor. He was actually um, a st steward. Um, you know, he he was he he ran a medical dispensary on a whaling ship, and um, so he had he was familiar with some of the quack medicines of the time. But he was not an MD, um, so there's a little bit of elaboration on on this guy of Long Ghost, um, and uh, so. But the other thing is, you know, there's a really good edition of Omu in what's called the Hendrix House series, which was uh, really the most complete annotated set of Melville you could find, starting in the 1950s, and they. They only got through about five Melville novels before they had to start, but they did, you know, they did a good edition of Moby Dick. They did one of Pierre. Uh, they did one of his short stories, and they did one of Omu, um, which has very, very extensive notes, and it shows how much uh, Melville borrowed from some of his written sources because one of the main sources for his work was a, a five-volume edition by a missionary named William Ellis called Poly Polynesian Researches. And that was a really important book for him because it also uh, was important for his next novel, Marty, when he started talking about all the gods uh, of uh, Polynesia. So there's a lot of William Ellis's um, observations about the Tahitians because he was a missionary there. Uh, he spent, he came from, he was a British missionary with the London Missionary Society. And his book was one of the most, you know, interesting and complete 
uh, analyses of Polynesian culture before you know you had anthropologists actually studying these peoples. I was, I was gonna say that was probably one of the things that stuck out to me most about the book that I enjoyed was how the Tahitian people were vaguely Christian. Yeah, they were, yeah. They, <laughs> they they were they had kind of a superficial Christian veneer. I'm not I'm not trying to indict them by saying that. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, they still very much had their culture that they that yeah. had been handed down for generations. And I thought that was fascinating do, the documentation of that. And it probably is it probably shows up in this book that you mentioned as well by the missionary. Well, of course the missionaries want the reader to think that these peoples have been miraculously converted to Christians and they've taken everything to heart and they're practicing, um, you know, New Testament uh, teachings and whatnot. But the reality, which the missionaries often didn't want to uh, recognize, was that, you know, these people would go back to their pagan ways occasionally and they'd you know, there was a lot of uh, random sex going on, a lot of adultery. That was part of their culture. It wasn't such a big deal, you know, just it's, like the it's, queen. It's, in the it's part book. of ours, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was, uh, you know, there's a famous scene in Omu where he talks about he talks about a young woman saying, you know, oh, you're a missionary. You know, missionary means you're a Christian, missionary. And she says, well, I'm, you know, above in my head, I'm a missionary. But, you know, when you go down below the waist, that's when yeah. you, you lose the missionary uh, <laughs> element. <laughs> well, we could make some jokes about that, couldn't we? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't mean to turn this into a salacious discussion. And I right. know you're going to hate this question. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. It's okay for you to show some real emotion. <clears throat> One of the other things, you know, you mentioned that this was a buoyant time in Melville's life because he met his future wife. Yeah. I know you're not going to like this, but there do seem to be a couple passages that are seem to be vaguely homoerotic. With with where? Well, he talks about the friendship with, on the boat. Oh, with, uh, oh well, uh, there, first what, what, of all, there's the, there's the idea of the Tao, which was a Polynesian institution where you become instant buddies with someone. Um, but that was, you know, that was totally... Uh, heterosexual, you know, it's called what, the what, yeah. what was his name? Was it Kulu? Was that Kulu? His name? Yeah, Kulu. Yeah, yeah, it's called the Tao T A Y O, and that was a habit of Polynesian men to become, you know, bonded with another guy as their friend. And it, it didn't never, as far as I know, didn't involve sexual um, uh, exchanges, but. The joke was in the novel or the story, the narrative was that this guy Kolu was totally mercenary. You know, the whole practice had degenerated from the kind of idealistic idea of being a romantic friendship uh, with with another guy that you you know you admire, and then um, this guy whose motives are totally mercenary he says he you know as soon as he meets Omu, you know he says, "Can I have this and can I have that?" and then. When someone else comes along, he kind of quietly disappears. Um, so it's a it's a kind of a joke how the this sort of anthropological custom, which was pretty much non-sexual, became uh, degenerated by the onset of too many Europeans with expen you know fancy um, possessions or clothes to give away or things that you know these people wanted because they were so poor. But, I mean, what I noticed rereading the book is that Omu, he's constantly noticing all these, you know, cute young Polynesian girls. And, so, and, then, totally. he, and then he falls desperately uh, in love with this Mrs. Bell, who's married to the uh, local sugar uh, plantation owner. And they go all the way over to the sugar plantation in the hopes of meeting her again. But she's gone somewhere else. But they... He sees her on horseback and is like mesmerized. So there, you know, there are scenes of little flirtation with, with, um, with some young women, and of course there's the the dance. I was gonna, I was gonna say Long Ghost is. He's, he's the one who's. He's the one that's like who's all kind of about, the lecher, yeah. yeah, 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 and you know he does a lot of smooching, 
with some of these young women, but he he gets a, his comic uh, um, payback, you know, with this young woman, Lou, who's the daughter of the guy they stay with at the very end, um, who's very generous and kind and whatnot. And, you know, they get a chance to see the queen. And, you know, Long Ghost is reading the Bible with her because she's supposedly devout. She's 14 years old. And he tries to, at one point, he's reading the Bible and he tries to put his arm around her. And then she has a little thorn that she sticks into him <laughs> when he tries to grab her. And he, you know, slinks off in shame. So we never really see much. Certainly not, it's not really as suggestive as Taipei, I think, in terms of, you know, in Taipei, you see Tamu, you know, being massaged by all these young uh, Marquesan women, you know, because they're rubbing this oil into him because he's kind of a semi-invalid, and um, then he's going swimming with them in the in the uh, pools in the valley there, and then he has a special friend, um, you know, he goes sailing with um, Feiway, you know, the famous Feiway uh, nymph. He was probably a fictitious character. But anyway, it, I think there there's the kind of suggestions of uh, um, you know physical inner f contact, but there's I don't think there's anything remotely approaching you know scenes of you know. Well, all all I can off, really say yeah. say in the critical literature that I've gone over with her Melville, there seems to be this this obsession with queering yeah melville yeah well, that's a that's a critical obsession today but often by people who don't know melville very well well i'm it's, not saying that i believe it i'm yeah. just you know i thought i thought you would have something interesting to say to these critics well to tell you the truth they kind of make me annoyed because they, <laughs> i know they do that's why i asked yeah <laughs> because, not, not because i not because i'm trying to push your buttons but i wanted yeah. to give you the opportunity to defend melville yeah, because I, you know, I'm publishing an article in a couple of weeks on Melville's letters to Hawthorne, and showing everyone says, "Oh, they're so passionate." You know, he must have been in love with Hawthorne. You know, he wanted to, we wanted to, you know, get up close and personal with him. And you know, this is total bullshit. That would have never happened. Hawthorne, you know, would was paranoid about anyone touching him. He he can't couldn't stand being touched by anyone except his wife. And the fact is, all the kind of flowery language that Melville used for Hawthorne, a lot of it goes right to the New Testament and the Bible. You know, he's he's kind of invoking the 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 sort of rhapsodic mysticism of the book of of the Gospel of John when he's talking about Hawthorne and how they, you know, he feels at one with him in spirit. You know, as a creative writer, and he yeah, understood Moby Dick. You know, so well, those same people probably are querying the Bible as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and the, you're right in the, in the new Testament and not even in the new Testament. If you go back, I, I was telling Dr. Cook that I was reading the Bible for the second time. I believe there's a relationship. David and Jonathan uh, is the most famous. Yeah. I was going to say Jonathan and yeah. what, what was his name? Well, da well da David, you know, it, it was King David. Yeah. Jonathan's yeah. the son of Saul. Right. So, you right. know, the love past surpassing the love of women, you know, but probably not homosexuality. Well, um, a lot of people, uh, yeah, I'm just saying there are a yeah. lot of people latch on to that as an, as an episode of homosexuality in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, which I was, you know, I was surprised that that exists there. I would say going through the Bible the second time, I found many surprises, but yeah. that was one of them. Uh, but we are talking about Omu. So what it, I'm just, I, um, have we talked about the significance of the name Omu? Omu. Well, you know, he says it means wanderer, but... Um, I'm from what I've read, there really isn't a word uh, in uh, the Marquesan dialect for wander. So, what I read was that it it conforms more with a Tahitian word for myth or myth myth uh, creating myths. Um, so I don't know what the latest research on that is, but it's doubtful that it actually you know is a is a word meaning beachcomber wanderer uh, the way Melville says it does. I mean, he, he did not, he, he, he learned a lot about uh, Polynesian languages from Ellis, William Ellis's Polynesian researches. I mean, he probably remembered a few phrases <clears throat> and whatnot, but 
he really had to read that book to know how to write some of the dialogue that he wrote in uh, in Omu. You know, because there are a lot of a fair number of Polynesian phrases that he translates um, right afterwards. Right. Well, we've talked about <laughs> we've talked about the uh, the romantic overtures and failures of Long Ghost. Yeah. Um, uh, perhaps we. I mean, we can elaborate on that more. But there's there's a, there's other comedic elements to discuss as well, right? Yeah, I mean, the book as a whole is Melville's funniest novel. I mean, yeah. people who read it for the first time after reading other Melville stuff, they you know, they just can't believe that he could write this kind of slapstick comedy um, that uh, is genuinely funny today still. Um, has, it, has it ever been adapted for the stage or anything? Do you know? Um, there was a movie version of 1949, but totally totally changed i haven't seen it but um i don't think it's very close to the to the book at all but the thing about the comedy is that um you know long ghost is the main um comic protagonist and i was reading something it's interesting so this writer was compared this critic was comparing him to falstaff because he's kind of a lord of misrule you know he's a prankster he's a jokester he has a huge appetite, but he's very thin. He, you know, he sits down and eats everything, but he can't, it doesn't show up on his body. So he is a kind of Falstaff figure, and it's telling that um, Omu has to reject him at the end of the book, or at least he doesn't reject him. But the the whaling captain that he signs on with of the Leviathan says he doesn't want Long Ghost because he thinks he's kind of a shady character. Um, and uh, versus, versus Tom, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Omu looks presents himself more as a as a promising young sailor. Um, so you could say Long Ghost is a kind of a a comic lord of misrule in that way. He's kind of like Uncle Toby in uh, Uncle Toby Belch in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Uh, that he's always up for a joke or a party and uh, likes to drink as well. So, uh, you know, it's amazing to think that he might have actually pulled some of these pranks off, you know, on the, sh on the boat, on the whaling ship. You know, he would tie a rope around a, a, a sleeping crewman's feet when they were in the focusle, and then he had a pulley rigged up so he could yank them up into the air to wake them up so they were left hanging there um, as a kind of a rude awakening. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the role of uh, alcohol and some of these pranks. Didn't they on on the ship? Didn't they have a a drink? Called yeah, Pisco. Pers Pisco. What what is Pisco? Well, do, it's do uh, it comes from a town of Pisco in Peru. Um, I would guess it's a, some kind of rum mixture, mm. um, but very strong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, they uh, you know they, they this guy John German, the first mate, tried to make up for the fact that no one liked the first liked the captain, and no one wanted to be out sailing on the ship, which was kind of leaky, and the only way to make them docile was to give them lots of this pisco, uh, to keep them um, you know half drunk all the time. So you know it's 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 very entertaining and. Uh, you know, it tells you kind of what it was like to be a, on a whaling ship at that point. You know, a little more entertaining than normal, normally on a ship. But um, um, so, you know, the figures are stock. A lot of the characters are, are sort of two-dimensional, but they're kind of funny for that reason. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, it's just... Uh, it's it's entertaining in a way that a lot of people who only have read Moby Dick would be very surprised about, and you know they'd be pleasantly surprised, I think, to to read it. And an entirely different vibe. Now, on your prompting, because um, I, I I I would need this question broken down, but I think you said that this was picaresque in the same way as a small and felding yeah. novel. Yeah. Now, now enlighten us. What does that mean? Who, okay, who, so picaresque. Who small and validating. <laughs> so picaresque uh, is a type of fiction. It still is around, but it's 
It was pioneered by the Spanish in the 16th century, and the picaro is basically a rogue who is surviving on the edges of society, who's poor, and um, who uh, has lots of different adventures. And in the process, you kind of learn about that society. You learn about the brutalities and corruptions of, of that particular world. So uh, the first official picaresque novel is called Lazarillo de Tormes, and um, from the 16th century. And then it was picked up and imitated by the French and the English in the 18th century. So one of the, you know, actually, you know, people could would consider, um, um, to backtrack a minute, um, Don Quixote is a picaresque novel. You know, it's the adventures of this traveling knight. Um, it's probably the most famous picaresque novel, obviously, but you had a, a guy named Le Sage, a Frenchman who wrote a book called the Gil Blas, um, about a Spanish picaro, but he's a good-humored guy who succeeds in the end. So it's a kind of a happy, happy marginal figure who doesn't suffer miserably the way the Spanish picaro uh, anti-hero would. And then you, in English literature, you had a guy named Tobias Smollett, who is writing in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s, who wrote a number of very entertaining novels. Uh, the most famous is called Roderick Random, another called Peregrine Pickle, uh, and they're English picaresque about young men who are struggling to survive on the margins of society, um, who in his books they they succeed pretty much in a way that they wouldn't in the Spanish tradition. So actually Melville alludes to Smollett uh, towards the end of Omu because when he's staying with the uh, the couple with the daughter Lou in, um, in in the town where the queen lives, the, he discovers uh, three novels of Smollett there, and so he says, "Oh, what a joy! You know, we have these novels we can read um, to keep ourselves entertained." Um, so it's interesting that he's reading Smollett. Probably true. Um, he's reading uh, picaresque fiction while he's living a life that is very much picaresque in in essence you know living mm. hand to mouth often with comic dimensions or satiric dimensions and very episodic so you know nothing is kind of linear in terms of plotting it's pretty much sort of accidental um so um yeah so i would say it's melville's most prominent example of of the picaresque as a form of fiction. I don't think he was deeply read in Picaresque, but I think he knew a bit of Smollett. He probably knew a bit of Fielding too, because Henry Fielding, um, his main form was the Picaresque. Tom Jones is, is probably the best known English Picaresque novel, you know, Adventures of Tom Jones. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the literary tradition he's working in. Um, it's a it's a great explanation. I, that's uh, something I knew nothing about, um, and the trajectory of these picaresque. Uh, but it's a label that's still used today. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. But I just Saul, didn't know the history. Uh, of Saul Bellow's novels are often deemed picaresque <laughs> because it's a you know somebody who's trying to survive in the world and whatnot. So I I, I learned the word for the first time from a band. Uh -huh. In like the mid two, in the mid two thousands, there's a band called the Decemberists. Oh yeah, uh, and th that name, the Decemberists, actually ha has a lot of resonance if you look into the history of it. Yeah, um, in terms of uh, geopolitics, but they had a record called Picaresque. Picaresque. And that's, yeah, yeah, that's how. That's that. I I believe I learned that word. I, uh, perhaps I didn't learn how to say it correctly. <laughs> about two thousand five or so. Um. So we talked a little bit about the relationship of the Tahitian people to missionaries. But one of these sub themes that goes on, and it's very interesting because I'm seeing it. I, I, I do a lot of um, research in theology and you see this, this sort of back and forth between how the Protestant and the Catholic missionaries are depicted. And there's a discussion about, I, I believe like what ultimately wins and it would, yeah. I, I don't want to spoil it here, but, 
could you maybe say something about the categorization of these two two sets of missionaries? Because it's not like they're monolithic. We've got two different sets of missionaries. Yeah. In in this in this novel. Yeah. Well, the Protestant missionaries, of course, are um, the Americans who were mainly from the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions. It was an organization started in about 1812, and they sent out their first uh, mission missionaries in uh, the late teens, and um, so they were in Tahiti, along with the British, uh, with the London Missionary Society. Uh, so there was a little bit of competition there between uh, those two groups. And then you had the French coming with a Catholic right, mission right. as well. And of course the Catholics, um, the the mistrust uh, and dislike of the Catholics has led eventually to the the French coming in with their warship, la, you know, La Reine Blanche, and seizing control of Thai, of uh, Tahiti because of the abuse of their, uh, you know, priests there, and so they use that as an excuse to exert their political power. So it, Melville has a kind of disgusted comment about how um, they came in on the backs of their missionaries. You know, they kind of took over because of. Um, the fact that the um, the British and Americans were there first, and the people had been kind of wooed over to their brand of Christianity, so they didn't really like the French. In fact, Fr Melville has some, you know, he has some critical things to say about the French in this in that book. And the French whalers, he said, they're not they're terrible whale men, and they're they're uh, you know the priests are kind of designing, and they've got girlfriends on the side and. You know they're giving their communion wine to the to people who <laughs> want to buy it off them. So there's a, a sort of a, a little bit of a you know corruption in, in the Catholic clergy there. I I just never had thought about the idea of rival missionary groups before, and how confusing that must have been to the indigenous people. Like that. To have yeah. what uh, we're going to come in with this form of Christianity, and then we're going to come in with this form of Christianity, right. and then. Like how confusing that must have been. Like, right. Well, especially like if it, the service is in Latin, you know, if they've, yeah. if they've got, um, um, you know, completely different traditions of, of Christianity. So, am I making this up in my mind? But I seem to remember. So, uh, I forget who said it in Omu, but it seemed like there was, it, it seemed like there was more sympathy with Catholicism, in the sense that it was like. That Protestantism was ultimately going to devolve into atheism. So really, it was the the war was between atheism and Catholicism. Well, do, do you, to tell you, do you, the remember, truth, do, do you know the discussion that I'm talking about? And the reason why this stuck out to me, as I see this, I see this playing out in a lot of the um, Reformation thought that yeah. that I read as well. But I, I think I remember first hearing this idea that Protestantism would lead to atheism. Yeah, in Omu. Do you I remember think, what? I, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm I'm trying to remember where the passage came up, but it it was really to tell you the truth. That's more of a a very important theme in his uh, his um, epic poem, Clarel. Um, well, maybe it was from Clarel because we it's recently from Clarel did that because as Because well. that that definitely has discussion about you know Protestantism. Protestantism is fragmentary. You know they're always breaking off into some new interpretation, and they're all going to just uh, finally fritter away the message of of Christianity until there's nothing left. So the it's going to be the conservative bulwark of tradition. You know the Catholics who are going to keep Christianity alive. Right. Well, um, maybe I've conflated them. For for those of you that don't know, I think this there's is the a first brief time. mention of it. Yeah. Yeah. If, for those of you that don't know. Uh, Dr. Cook and I uh, did a discussion of, of Melville's epic poem, uh, Clarel, and I also did a recording of it uh, for the, and I, I don't believe anyone's ever done it. So it's, that's available on YouTube if you want to check that out. Um, do you want to say anything else about these missionaries or? Well, I, it's interesting because um, there's, it, he doesn't come down as harshly against them as he does in Taipei. Taipei, he really kind of uh, just destroys, you know, kind of what they've done as the kind of uh, uh, the secret army that, that sort of facilitates the arrival of 
you know, whale men with with uh, with venereal disease and uh, merchants who want to cheat the people. So it's it's sort of the it's the tip of the spear of mm -hmm. Western, you know, imperialism coming in to these islands. So he's not quite as harsh, but he does basically say, and there's one chapter talking about the Western influence, including the missionaries, that, you know, the population has shrunk down to, a, you know, from 100, 200,000 down to 10,000 people because of diseases, venereal disease, mainly syphilis, and... Um, and they're not really always the best Christians, you know. They're not. They're kind of happy people who are kind of superficially interested. They they want to please the missionaries, and they could say, "Oh yes, I'm a Christian," but you know, it's not really having a strong an impact. I mean, definitely not as much as as Hawaii. Hawaii was the was kind of the gold standard for the missionaries where they supposedly they basically took over the government and you know changed the laws and brought kind of an old testament rigor to the law in hawaii um on the, the hawaii yeah the hawaii thing's very interesting yeah. uh so it's not at I, all like that in tahiti uh, i um I, I think I first kind of remember looking at the history of Hawaii. I think, you know, Comedy Central does those drunk histories. Have you ever oh, seen? Oh, yeah. Have you ever seen those? No, I haven't. I'm a, uh, essentially, what they do is they take like a stand up comic and get and say, look, you're going to memorize all these facts about uh, a, a battle, a person, yeah. a president, or something like that. And then they get them really drunk and try yeah. to get them to <laughs> huh. essentially do what you and I are yeah, doing, right. but intoxicated. And it, it leads to hilarity because they acted out as well, but they did one on, um, on that, uh, culture clash between the indigenous people and, uh, <clears throat> the, I forget the names, but it, uh, the, the, the West and, and the indigenous people. So, which was really, really interesting. And I, I guess I realized recently that there's a King of, of Hawaii statue, I believe in the Senate building that we oh, have. Really? Do you, yeah. I don't know yeah. about it now. I, I found out about it because, you know, uh, when, uh, the, during the BLM protests, um, yeah. Pelosi at all, uh, did the kneeling with yeah. the, with the, uh, uh -huh. Kenyan dress or whatever. And, uh, they did it near that statue and I had to find out what that yeah. statue was. Yeah. Have, it's, it's a, it's a black and gold statue. If you want to go check it out, it's, yeah. it's, I believe you can look it up on the government websites or whatever. It's yeah. a beautiful statue. Well, one other uh, thing about the missionary uh, element of the story is that Melville is definitely kind of having fun with it by naming himself Paul and, uh, and long ghost is Peter, you know, so they're Peter and Paul spreading, right. the, spreading the gospel of, uh, kind of um, laziness <laughs> and uh, work avoidance. Um, and I, yeah, I, have... I read an article that says that, that he's actually parodying the missionaries, uh, people like William Ellis who went around claiming that they were such, you know, the, the Tahitians were such great Christians after he had uh, gone through there. So there definitely is a bit of parody there. Um, yeah, that's something we haven't really talked about is how the novel is kind of a novel about work resistance. I mean, with the mutiny and yeah, and laziness like <laughs> you spoke of. Or, um, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Well, yeah, it's an interesting theme because, um, uh, you know, Tamu, he, he's not the main culprit. I think Long Ghost is the one who really doesn't want to do the farm work. You know, he kind of picks his has a hoe and he really doesn't want to do the work there so um and and um tomo he you know wants to get ashore because he claims he only shipped for one voyage so but he also believes in work and he mentions the fact that the tahitians don't really have much of a work ethic that all these one thing is they're not planting the palm trees where they could be growing you know, they're not cultivating their land. He's saying they're just not very enterprising. And uh, even though, you know, he's having fun by avoiding work, 
he's getting free food by traveling around. He's not totally given over to laziness, you know. He embraces a work ethic, but he's just having fun by playing along with Long Ghost and being a tourist, you know. He's learning about uh, Tahiti like any young man would want to travel around and learn about the history and talk to people. So, um, And he goes back to work at the end of the book, right? Because Long <laughs> yeah, Ghost yeah. Uh, is not really a good candidate for you know being a serious... Uh, whale man you know so he's he's kind of on a on a sort of dividing line between not wanting to work but also respecting the work ethic it's interesting that how how the whole novel ends with a like a failed job interview right yeah <laughs> so but, uh we've we've talked a little bit about through other lenses we talked a little bit about tahitian life and its glimmering virtues or whatnot um, I think we mentioned the dancing when we were yeah, talking about right. the sexual es escapades or the the more salacious aspects of it. But what else could we say about Tahitian life Yeah, uh, that's captured here that we haven't already said? Well, you know, the characters quite, aren't quite as vivid as in Taipei, where he's living in the Taipei Valley and the, the, the family that he lives with, we hear a lot about their habits and how much what they seem like is... Is kind of like the routines of middle class, you know, Europeans, but transferred to a completely different setting. Uh, but here, um, we mainly the characters are sort of comic figures, but they're very gentle, they're kindly, they're easygoing. Um, and um, as a culture, I think Melville is saying they're a little bit too passive um you know i think it ties in with the idea that they they're not really working hard they're living pretty much on the brink of um you know their food security is not great sometimes and they could be planting you know all these palm trees to have coconuts all the time and they're not doing it um and it takes people from outside to come and farm the land like zeke and shorty so um but he's very you know, I think he respects these people. He's sympathetic to them. He hates the fact that they've been harmed by the Europeans who have chosen to missionary uh, to missionize them and to uh, use them as a port for whale whaling ships. Um, so, uh, but he gives a pretty big cross section. I think it what he says about the royal family at the end is quite amusing. You know, where the uh, the Pawiti, the the queen, you know, the royal family is kind of a a vixen, you know, who right. um, they sneak in and they try to meet, but of course she doesn't, you know, they shouldn't really be there. And she's gotten to a kind of a fist fight with her husband, the king. Uh, but she's actually, well, she's the royalty, he's a prince because she's the um, sister of a, of, a, of a young king who died, you know. Um... So it's very amusing. Um, of course, you know, Henry Adams wrote extensively about Tahiti later on, uh, you know, when he was staying there, living there for a while. He wrote a whole history of their, um, of their, uh, of their political life. Um, also, I just mentioned briefly that one a, a really wonderful novella of Robert Louis Stevens, t Stevenson, takes place, starts out in Tahiti, called the Ebb Tide, mm. um, about three um, down-and-out sailors. One, we, we, maybe we should talk about it sometime. Sure, um, sure. But, I, you know, you really get a sense of this culture from the book because they travel through quite a number of small settlements. They're, they're you know, living on the coast. We learn about the, the uh, landscape and the and the topography of the uh, of the main island Tahiti and uh the houses that the people live in um so you know it's kind of like another work of anthropology like like Taipei um in some sense um certainly he's a sympathetic observer well the the interesting thing, type type P was a bit of a, a hit for him, wasn't it? It was kind of like an early hit. Yeah. Because I think I think I recall him feeling if I if I recall correctly, I don't know if it was when I was listening to the 
letters to Hawthorne. I think he, there was some concern that maybe he would only be known for type. Yeah. E or right. Type. Right. And, and this is in a lot of ways, right. This is the sequel. Was there a, was there a lot of anticipation for Omu? Did it go yeah, over well? What yeah. was the reception like? He had more reviews for Omu than any other book. So um, he had, I think, about 24 British reviews and about 48 American reviews. So it got reviewed extensively. It, it sold um, pretty well. Uh, I think 4,000 copies within the few, first few months. It was reprinted several times throughout the 19th century. Um, so it was one of his most popular books. But of course, when you're talking popular, it's nowhere near as popular as the bestsellers of the time, which were, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, sold 100,000 copies in, in the first couple of months, you know. So he was not making a lot of money, but he was, he was definitely kind of a, a literary celebrity um, still at this point, and people read Omu and they weren't disappointed. Um, and when when he wrote his later works, you know, Moby Dick and Pierre, and his later fiction, they would look back to Taipei and Omu as sort of the Melville they wanted to be reading, even though, you know, it was his early apprentice work. Yeah, I mean, I it's it's fascinating. Like I, I don't. I don't think I'd really ever come across Omu until I was doing a lot of deep research for Clarell, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting that it was such, it made such a splash, but I haven't heard about it as much in the 20th and 21st yeah. century, which raises the question about where do we see this in yeah. uh, Melville's canon now? Well, it's not that well known. I mean, all of Melville is read these days by academics. Uh, but it really deserves a popular audience, um, and uh, it has uh, a modest amount of criticism. I mean, um, when I went on to JSTOR, there were, you know, just ten articles in the last, you know, fifty years on Oma, which isn't really that much. Um, but there are a lot of chapters and books on it in in surveys of Melville's work, and. Um, I, I think, you know, people enjoy it. They think that it wasn't, obviously, it's not really philosophically profound, but it's certainly entertaining, and it's, it's every, you have to read it if you want to know Melville's work and his, and his development. So um, I think, you know, the general reader would definitely get enjoyment out of it if they, if they want to read a, a funny book by Melville, you know. It's certainly. not the normal certainly. thing that they, that they would think of. Certainly. I don't think it'll ever be on college reading lists um, the way Moby Dick or Benito Serino or Bartleby are. Um, well, it's so hard to predict. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, you know, there have been, we've, we've covered a lot of Melville. Yeah. And I think some of the ones that I've gravitated towards the most, I, I you just don't, you know, maybe in 50 years, they will be, the, they'll supplant the ones that are on the college reading list. I, I, I felt this, I have this strange magnetism to Pierre. That was one yeah. of the ones that. Re oh yeah. I think Pierre is brilliant. And, yeah, I, and definitely that should be taught much more because there's so much in it, <clears throat> you know, so many dimensions to it. That, that but one, there really are some people, who, some people who read it and hate it. So I, um, I, I, I think, you know, more people have to make a case for why it's a good, good book or a brilliant book. What do you, do you think there's anything within the canon that will be reshuffled and prioritized 50 years from now? Like people will see it as in the, I guess we're in canon. Can, yeah. I guess we're kind of, we kind of, I guess we kind of agree about Pierre, but well, are there I any mean, other Melville has been recovered, rediscovered, re, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, renewed in his interest for a hundred years. So, I think at this point, pretty much the <clears throat> people have been able to separate what has the interest that will sustain, you know, hundreds of articles and books versus the ones that will only yield a smaller, much smaller crop of interest. But it doesn't mean that it's not entertaining reading. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So, well, I, I mean, although I didn't enjoy Clarell as much as I enjoyed Pierre, I could see Clarell like I, 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 I view Clarell as a great uh, mystery to be decoded. It's not like a ple- it, 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 it wasn't as pleasurable as other his yeah. other poetry. Like we, we did battle pieces and whatnot, yeah. which I think that I could see that getting more attention in the future. But I feel like there's it's Clarell has so much meaning in it. That's being weighted. That's it. That is waiting to be decoded. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if anyone's going to come along and do all that hard work and ring it out. Well, it's getting, you know, there's a fair amount of criticism already and there's more, more and more coming. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So. I'm just I'm just making horse bets here about wh- where I could see things <laughs> sifting out yeah. in the future well. as someone who doesn't know the entire canon. Um, <clears throat> well, I think we've we covered a yeah, good amount of ground. Covered there, everything, it, huh? Yeah. Uh, let's talk off air for a little bit and talk about what we might want to do next. But I, I think this is a lovely conversation and I'll try to get this edited and up tonight or in the morning. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Cook again for enlightening us on. Uh, this particular work of Melville, which inevitably uh, cast forth light on the entire Melville canon. So, yeah, thank you again, Dr. Okay, Cook. Okay, good. Look forward All to right. our next thing. All right. Over and out. Take care.